Have you ever wondered how the clothes you wear not just make an impact on the planet, but also how you feel about yourself and about your body? Then you will really enjoy today's episode with Bryn and Jess from Double. They will share with us how they are empowering women with custom-made bras. When anyone's physically uncomfortable, it affects other areas of your lives. You lean in less often, you raise your hand less often, you ask for less opportunity. And we really felt passionately about that not being a barrier for women any longer. They will share with us how their on-demand and made-to-measure production creates more sustainable products. We also wanted to try to create a business that had a, a positive impact and kind of this new way and new model of manufacturing so that people can get a product that works for them, but also we're, you know, building something that can be sustainable for decades. And they will share with us how they are revolutionizing the whole bra market. It's an industry that hasn't developed in over a hundred years and the current sizing model only takes into consideration two horizontal measurements. So it leaves out a huge percentage of women on the extremities and also women who don't fall into this like two inch increments. Hello and welcome to the Impact for Linda show. I'm your host, Dennis Kamprat, and today we are joined by Bryn Williams and Jess Bosman from Double. Bryn, Jess, welcome. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you. Well, thanks for being there. I'm super excited. It's the first time that we're having a podcast with two guests. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So before we getting into it and telling your journey, tell us a little bit about Bo Double. What is it? And kind of like a big picture for, for all of us. Yeah, so Double is the first ever made-to-measure bra that you can order completely online. Um, so you buy it the way you'd buy anything else um, on e-commerce, but it's made directly exactly to your measurements. Mm -hmm. Nice. And the main purpose behind the company is the fact that we wanted to empower women to feel comfortable in their everyday lives and allow them to be capable of doing anything that they want to do because we saw a huge correlation in our research that when women are physically uncomfortable, when, when anyone's physically uncomfortable, it affects other mm -hmm. areas of your lives. You lean in less often, you raise your hand less often, you ask for less opportunity. And we really felt passionately about that not being a barrier for women any longer. Awesome. So it sounds like a twofold thing as like on the one hand, women's empowerment, and on the other hand, also when you're making your bras made, well, basically to order when sir wants to order to, to ship them out, cutting down on any kind of waste from, from items that would never get uh, shipped out otherwise. Yeah, exactly. Sweet. Now let's, let's go back a little bit in, into kind of seeing how, how the journey and everything started. Let's get started with what's your, what's your backstory? What did you do before? Well, starting with double. Yeah, yeah that's so a great question. <laughs> you go ahead, Bryn. Jess and I met at business school, so we were in the same section mm -hmm. at Ivy in our first year of business school, and we bonded on a trip to uh, Yale University where we were doing mm -hmm. a um, conference on women's leadership. And we both had always been interested in starting our own business and charting our, our own path, and we worked together on a project in second year around a new venture creation. And that's kind of where the initial idea for a made-to-measure bra that could be ordered online came from. Mm -hmm. But we both went our separate ways into our careers, kind of leaving that, you know, at school. Um, and I joined Unilever uh, as a in brand management and specifically Unilever because they had a bit more of a sustainability agenda than a lot of the other CPG companies did at mm -hmm. the time. So I've been working there for the last five years. Um, and then I'll pass it over to Jess to tell her backstory. Yeah, so I've always had a really strong interest in fashion. So after business school, I started my career at Essence and I was in the buying department. And that's sort of where my love for fashion and understanding the industry sort of snowballed. And then uh, most recently, I've also had experience at MEC, Mountain Equipment Co. in Vancouver, as well as Herschel. So that whole entire like buying, merchandising, seeing products being brought to life from A to Z assortment planning has been my background. Nice. So a little bit of a business background combined with some like more like fashion or like basically from the industry. Yeah, yeah, nice. exactly. We feel that we have complementary skills in that way. We're just missing our, our technical, our technical right hand mm -hmm. man. Awesome. Yeah, I'm super excited. I, I spoke to Brim before and already that I also have an Ivy connection. I did my exchange semester and my master's over there. So it's quite oh, excited amazing. to speak to two more Ivy people. Oh, that's so great. Cool. Now then, Let's switch a little bit from, from your background to, well, what was the, the actual problem that you encountered on your way before basically getting started? What was it that, that well, triggered it? 
Yeah. So when we were thinking of ideas, we were looking mainly at industries that hadn't had any innovation for a very long time, Mm -hmm. as well as thinking about personal problems that we had experienced. So that led us as a group of women to looking at our bras. It's an industry that hasn't developed in over a hundred years and the current sizing model only takes into consideration two horizontal measurements. So it leaves out a huge Mm -hmm. percentage of women on the extremities and also women who don't fall into this like two inch increment um, like sizing range currently. So right now all of the sizes are basically dispersed by two inches. So there's lots of women that fall outside of that ratio. So we're finding that so many people can't find the right support. So many people are left uncomfortable. So many people are left feeling that there's something wrong with their bodies rather than something wrong with the retail system. So mm-hmm. that's sort of the main, the main like place where the concept came from. And then just to add to that, you touched on it already, Dennis, right? But this mm-hmm. I- idea of we're living in a fast fashion world yeah. and it's not sustainable in the long run for for people to be buying at you know such high consumption levels and discarding items so quickly so we also wanted to try to create a business that had a, a positive impact and kind of this new way a new model of manufacturing so that mm-hmm. you know people can get a product that works for them but also we're you know building something that can be sustainable for decades to come awesome so basically, it sounds like you you were already with your mindset that you wanted to start something. Then you encountered some problems, um, either from yourself or from some other friends. You figured out like there's a whole industry about the brass that's kind of a little bit messed up. One with the measurements and the second thing is with how it's being manufactured. Took that along the way. And now here we are. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think it's also been really Mm -hmm. interesting to just follow the industry over the years. So when Bryn and Mm -hmm. I officially incorporated the business and started working on it, that was three years ago. So we had some work experience by then. And in like my personal experience in the fashion industry, there was such a shift from like when I had graduated, not many people were speaking about sustainability. It wasn't at the Mm -hmm. forefront. And then when we had started and fast forward to now as well, there's such a strong focus on sustainability and how every player in the ecosystem really matters and change really does have to start at the top or at the consumer level. But every single person, if it's your raw material supplier, if it's your, um, your manufacturer, if it's your shipping materials, like your packaging, whatever it is, you have the, that decision to make every step of the way. And there's multiple mm-hmm. players that really need to be pushing to make the right decision in order for the entire like logistics and ecosystem to mm-hmm. be sustainable. And it's been really wonderful seeing some companies really make these huge efforts in their vendor manuals or whether it be, you know, hiring third party consulting firms to ensure that they're reducing their carbon footprint and making those decisions yeah. and that consumer also demanding it as well. So that's something we've really brought into double and ensured that we're working with largely mm-hmm. sustainable partners and looking for consumers that really have that care as well. Amazing. Now, that's something that's, that's really nice to notice actually after the past couple of years, how much sustainability has become more and more to the forefront, like slowly changing from like some companies have it to more and more to nearly becoming like a must for, for companies mm-hmm. to survive, which is amazing. Now, before we going into, I would love to, to hear, hear so much more about like all the sustainability measures that you're, that you're um, doing at Double. Let's take one step back. So basically from your background, before we jump in, what was the concrete first starting point? You mentioned already it's like three years ago, but what was like the concrete first step for you? Yeah, so I'd say it, it happened more as like a slide than like a concrete mm-hmm. step for us at least because we had this idea for so long um, and we're best friends. So every time we would meet, we would talk about it. But the mm-hmm. like official beginning was when we decided to incorporate. So we hired a legal team and we did an official incorporation. And that was in, in July of 2020. And mm-hmm. not all businesses have to incorporate from the beginning, right? It, it just, for us, it was important because when you look at grants and, you know, down the road from a funding perspective, sometimes you have to have had incorporated for a couple of years. Mm-hmm. It also meant because there's two of us from a shareholder agreement perspective, we were just getting everything clean and ready to go from the beginning. So mm-hmm. that was the business concrete step was, yeah. you know, making, deciding to incorporate. But then from the product initial step, um, 
it was for us as a product, it's all about getting a minimum viable product, right? Your MVP. Mm -hmm. So, um, the first step we did there, which was such a, uh, you know, starting a new business. First step was we Mm -hmm. went on Upwork, one of those freelance sites, and we tried to find a pattern maker who could make a bra for us. Um, and we paid somebody to make kind of our first prototype and it was horrible. Like (laughs) we we refer to it as... You mean a great learning experience? (laughs) Yeah. But the bra itself (laughs) was not functional. Like we refer Mm -hmm. to that prototype as our like boob hammock. Like there was no support (laughs) at all. So... Those were, I think, the two first big business steps where we incorporated and then we made our first prototype, which is never supposed to be great, but ours was particularly bad. That's a good yeah. start, starting point. What came first, the incorporation or the prototype? The incorporation. Oh, wow. Business goal, no? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nice. And then from the first prototype, it's I mean, it's amazing to take the first step. A lot of people have the idea in mind and they never take the first step. But once you have something concrete, it's super easy to feel like, oh, how can this be improved here or there? So what was the what was the next steps for you? How did you go from the boob hammock, the bra hammock? <laughs> um, how did you go the next steps there to, well, basically improve it? Yeah, I would say it's been a journey of baby steps. It was such a huge learning curve. And despite having some industry mm-hmm. experience, it was so... Yeah, it was so interesting learning about like we had less, neither of us had a lot of experience in the development side. So it was learning about how complicated this project was. Like the breast is one Mm -hmm. of the most difficult areas of the whole body to fit because, you know, the volume is malleable and everyone has a different shape and different size and different weight and people have different need states. So it was, yeah, it was definitely very challenging. So we were learning about who we even needed, that there was differences between designers and developers and pattern makers. So Mm -hmm. finding the right people. And it took us a very long time, I would say, to find people that were specialized in the right areas, who were also really good fits for the company, who felt really passionately about our story. And then just kind of slowly putting one foot in front of the other, finding manufacturers that were willing to work with a startup that uses on-demand manufacturing, where you're not placing these like large bulk orders very much in advance Mm -hmm. so not everyone is excited to be working with a business like that and we're very fortunate in that we found a really wonderful manufacturer who is really passionate about our idea but yeah it was totally baby steps i would say really until the last six months have we completely figured it out and we have Mm -hmm. such a wonderful team but yeah it Mm -hmm. was a very very long learning (laughs) oh wow how many iterations, if you had to guess, were in between, like the starting three years ago to having the first functional product last six months? Um, I want to say well, close we... to, to 10, probably, mm-hmm. in terms of like net new prototypes with like a new design or, you know, slight, slight alterations. I think, yeah, mm-hmm. I think close to 10. Yeah, that's probably oh, well. right. Mm-hmm. 10 prototypes and two and a half years later. <laughs> It's amazing yeah. what these iterations can do to a product, no? Yeah, totally. and lots of sampling in between there. You already mentioned, Jess, that it was quite difficult finding the right factory, finding the right producer for, for the product in the end um, that will produce it on demand as well. What were your steps on, on getting this also then in connection with keeping the product sustainable as well? I did the Western Accelerator at the beginning of this year. Um, And so Mm -hmm. one of my big goals of that accelerator was to find um, the right factory for us. And we wanted to keep the the manufacturing if possible in Canada. Um, Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when you're closer to the product, you can better assess whether, you know, quality from the product side, but also whether the factory is following, you know, industry standards from an, an ethical perspective and, knowing that people are being paid a living wage also was important to us. So we kept our, our scope to Canada. And then mm-hmm. we, you know, it was honestly as, as simple as Googling factories that existed. Um, mm-hmm. But I was in that London, Ontario ecosystem, and I kept meeting people, and they kept telling me about this amazing uh, designer named Carmina Young, who mm-hmm. had started a factory a few years ago to make PPE, and now, you know, with the need for PPE decreasing, kind of, you know, post the height of the pandemic, had turned her factory into more of a manufacturing for fashion products. 
So I reached out to her directly and, and it was such a great fit because Carmina is, is, has always been interested in sustainability. So her clothing line is a sustainable women's clothing line, Carmina Young. And then her mm-hmm. factory uses all of those sustainable principles as well. So they don't throw out any scraps from any of the materials they use. They look to um, figure out new ways to use those materials, um, including working with um, different, like not-for-profits in the local area. And she also employs, you know, people paying them a, li- a living wage um, and is always kind of looking for new ways to to have that sustainable impact. So she was a great fit for us. Also, the fact that it was a women-owned factory was mm. important as well. Nice. So it's basically you already with this factory you already have like the two big parts as one ensuring that there's no material waste and the second thing is that people be getting paid a living wage or even I think I've seen on your on your websites even well above the living wage not just the basic minimum no. Yeah, because especially for bras you need people who have a lot of technical expertise, right? So these aren't aren't junior sewers. They're yeah. you know quite high and, and paid for the skill that they have. Nice. And from the materials itself. Did you decide, like, based on the on the bra when you're designing it, as like, okay, let's let's get the bra first and see like what fits best there, or did you already have like the sustainability in mind? It's like, oh, okay, when we design it, let's cut out these materials and only try to use the sustainable ones. Yeah, that's a great question. We tried to use as many sustainable materials as possible um, while also balancing cost a little bit because obviously mm-hmm. we have pretty high cost being on demand and then also trying to be as sustainable as possible but the majority of our bra is made out of recycled polyester which is really great Mm -hmm. so i would say probably at least 80 percent is recycled materials and we also use the majority of our fabric comes from like a bc based supplier which is really great Mm -hmm. so we tried to work locally again um and they've been a really great partner for us um and then for our packaging we also use recycled bubble mailers and um, shipping locally obviously is one of the best ways to reduce your carbon emissions because flying items through cross country over with planes mm-hmm. and overseas is one of the you know the largest sustainable impacts. So those are kind of like our our biggest measures, I mm-hmm. would say. I'll just add in one more that's important. Yeah. Um, so to dye our, our fabric, we use sublimation. Oh, yeah. And sublimation is a heat transfer printing. And the reason mm-hmm. that that is so sustainable is that like traditional dyeing is you would dye, you know, you have water that is is treated with the color and then you you dye the materials. The problem with that, and I know we know this firsthand because we, we did the, the dyeing of our straps ourselves, is that it produces fumes, which in a non-aerated place is toxic and also uses a lot of water. So mm-hmm. by not doing the traditional dyeing methods and using this heat, heat transfer printing instead, we're cutting all of the water waste that comes with the dyeing and also we're protecting the people who are working on on the dyeing. And it produces the same rich color that you would get from a dye and also helps us make really nice patterns um, so we have a lining that has a pattern in it and it's very crisp because we've used the sublimation. Mm-hmm. Obviously, again, it's a bit more expensive than traditional dyeing, um, but those are the kinds of trade-offs you make and you hope that consumers will understand that when they look at the price point. Mm-hmm. So basically, if, if someone was ordering a bra from your, from Double, um, they would get a locally made bra out of recycled materials uh, shipped in a recycled container, um, shipped locally ideally, and the color that they can see is made in a dyeing process that is non-toxic and doesn't use all that water that traditional processes would use. Yeah, and made exactly two measurements. Oh, and that <laughs> as well. Nice. Um, now that's a, that's a good transition as well to, before we look into the future and go into some of the next parts, let's say someone wants to, well, get a bra made to their measurements. Um, what would be the best best way to get that done or how could they could they best reach you yeah so it's super easy all you have to do is go to our website so www.double.ca right now we're only selling into canada but we're expanding into the u.s in the fall um Mm -hmm. and you check out just like how you would check out from any other e-commerce company so you add the product to cart there are no sizes so you just pick the color Mm -hmm. that you want 
and then you check out. And after you check out, you're sent an email to do your scan. So Mm -hmm. we use digital extracted measurements. So you do your scan with your smartphone. There are no pictures taken. We don't store any photos. There are no photos to begin with. We use photogametry, which is your silhouette. That Mm -hmm. silhouette allows us to extract a number of measurements. Those measurements go through our algorithm, and then that spits out a bespoke individualized pattern. But from a consumer standpoint, all you do is you do your scan. It takes one minute. You just wear black tight fitting mm-hmm. clothing. You stand in, in two poses um, all through the app. And then you get your bra delivered directly to your door. Amazing. So depending on when when someone watches this video, they could order just from in from Canada or most likely also within the US. Just order normally, put it in the cart. They don't even have to worry about the sizes at all. Get some email for all the instructions scan their silhouette without any pictures taken and they get the bra delivered with the right measurements. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Right now, because we're small, we're doing batched orders, right? So we do like a pre-production mm-hmm. sales run and then we close off sales as we produce. So in the event that there is no stock available, we have a restock alert so people can just sign up to be notified when we're back in stock. Awesome. And... You mentioned already like in in autumn, there's a next batch probably coming and also the opportunity to ship to the US. What else is, what else are some plans for the future for you? Yeah, we're really excited about next steps. We're going to be doing a photo shoot in the next couple of months because we have initially launched with our signature Merlot color. That's this like very beautiful, rich red. And we got Mm -hmm. a lot of feedback that people really want their neutral black and whites. So we will be offering black and white in the fall. So we're doing another photo shoot to showcase the new colorways, as well as there has been a few like aesthetic changes to the pattern just to offer a little bit more support and um, less visibility through t-shirts. We really want the bra to be Mm -hmm. kind of like as seamless as possible. So we're going to be doing a great photo shoot so people can really, really understand and see the product properly. And then we're hoping to do a little bit of like an official launch party to get people a little bit more involved with the brand and get to, you know, touch and feel some of the prototypes and celebrate all of the three years of hard work that we've been doing. And then as far as like future, future, we have a lot of really great silhouettes in the pipeline. We're really looking to hopefully do an active bra for women who are a little bit more on the go as well as a nursing bra and eventually bras for like mastectomies and things like that so Mm -hmm. we really want to have a very inclusive range and obviously women have more than one bra in their drawer Mm -hmm. we realize that we don't expect our t-shirt bra to fill every need so eventually we'd love to tackle the strapless bra for example so doing kind of a plethora of bras and then eventually hopefully expanding also into underwear and professional clothing. So a lot of women struggle with, for example, buttons on button up shirts as the the buttons start to pull where their chest is. Mm -hmm. So just expanding this made to measure and fitting clothing exactly to you in multiple areas of the apparel space. And we're also excited to hopefully do some interesting retail experience type things as we expand into brick and mortar and, Mm -hmm. you know, some unusual and exciting wholesale partnerships. And then the other thing I'll Mm -hmm. add is that we're also doing our first fundraising round um, in the fall. So, and we are hoping Mm -hmm. to work specifically with an impact investor, um, Mm -hmm. but obviously are also open to to other people in the investment space, but we are looking to do our our big first round um, in that fall timing. Amazing. So it sounds like it's it's a lot lot of things going on and a lot of plans for the future. So one Mm -hmm. of the basic steps is expanding from a t-shirt bra to enabling women, well, to basically get any kind of bra they would want want to have in addition that perfectly fits their body. Then the next step, it sounded like, is, well, going beyond the bra and offering different types of of clothing for women that would also then perfectly fit. And would that also be with the body, with the silhouette scan then to make it fit perfectly? Mm -hmm. Nice. And then... When you're going into brick and mortar, that sounds like that would be a little challenge to make it also fit with the silhouette scan. Yeah. Yeah, what's okay. interesting is there is an opportunity with the technology to have a physical mm-hmm. booth. So we've kind of like ideated because obviously we wouldn't have a physical mm-hmm. store with lots of product in it since we're yeah. made to measure and made on demand. So 
we've thought of really like unique ways of how we can have like a studio space and how can people feel involved in the process. And not every person is really comfortable with technology and using their iPhone. So it'd be really wonderful if we could have that physical option as well, where you walk in and you put on some tight clothing and then actually go through the booth as your scanning process. So just offering some alternatives and also just, you know, showcasing the brand in a, a very mm -hmm. like physical space. That sounds amazing. Basically giving yeah. the people the real experience on, on how that works and giving them, well, ensuring them, well, everything is as perfect as well with that book. Awesome. Super exciting also with the, with the funding um, and looking into some, well, impact investment. Yeah. Now, before we going into the, into the next step, is there anything that I forgot to ask you or that we forgot to talk about so far about Double? Um, the one thing I think, because this is a video podcast, we then yes. have the opportunity to do show and tell. So I do have a bra right here. Mm -hmm. So this is the color we were talking about. That's so a beautiful really, color. Yeah, deep red. Um, we call it Merlot. Um, and you can see the way that we have the seams on the cup, which allows for a customized fit, because typically the bra is, is done using molded foam. So there's only, you know, four or five different molded foam options. So this actually contours exactly to your body. Um, and all of this is done with sublimation printing. And then we have this mm -hmm. really fun pattern on the inside, again, done with sublimation printing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so this is our, our uh, final product prototype. Oh, mm -hmm. don't really, can't really say too much, but it looks really well done. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> all in the fit, right? So, so the proof is in the pudding and we've had some really mm -hmm. great results from our initial beta testers. Um, and it's just, you know, so cool from a technology perspective that someone can do this scan and we can send them a bra that fits them perfectly. So um, we're really excited for all the things to come and all the people who we can fit a bra for. Awesome. It sounds, sounds super exciting as well, like from both perspectives, like women's empowerment and also having an amazing product ethically and sustainably produced. Yeah. Now, mm -hmm. we will put some, some links as well into the show notes and how people can find you, double.ca. Um, yeah. And let's make a slight tra transition now to the next part. So based on your journey with Double, what have, has personally changed for you? How have you lived some, somewhat differently based on what you figured out, like from the ethics, sustainability perspective, or basically also on the perspective on, on how bras should fit? Anything for your personal life that has changed? Yeah, this is a great question. I think Brynn and I have always felt really passionately about shopping sustainably, whether that's thrifting or investing into local designers and products that are made with like really sustainable materials that last a very long time. And we always talk about ident um, identifying our personal style. So there's more longevity to your clothing and you're not just following trends. And then the bra industry is an interesting one because not very many people buy secondhand underwear, obviously. And mm. there's fewer options also when you look to local designers and things like that, and as well as those need states. So we, when we were thinking about the business, it was like, how can we create this model in the most sustainable way possible, but also scalable? So I think as we've just dove like more and more into the business, something that we've done a lot recently is reached out to local founders just to learn more about their story and about, mm. you know, how they've brought this business to life because everyone does it differently. And it's so great to learn from people that have gone through the process. It's been so, so helpful for us. And we really appreciate everyone who's spoken to us. And I think we've just like continued to dive deeper into that. And we're always supporting local brands. I feel like it's almost the only thing we shop now. So I would mm. say that's one of the large impacts it's had on our personal lives. Yeah. And I think the other thing is just understanding um, companies better from a sustainability perspective, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's like Jess alluded to earlier, there's so many components that make up a product's life cycle. And there's so many opportunities for either sustainable choices or unsustainable choices at each of those, you know, junctions. And I think mm -hmm. that's why something like the impactful ninja is important, right? Because you, Dennis, are doing the research for people because it's a lot of yes. research that needs to be done, right? Everything mm -hmm. from like we've experienced, right? Like how are the colors created for the product, right? Like at that very raw material stage, is the is the finished good flown 
to where it's being distributed. Mm -hmm. How is it being distributed? What's that packaging? And, you know, there's lots of, I think, misinformation out there. Like when we were looking into packaging, we were looking into the standard, you know, plastic bubble mailers. And a lot of that plastic isn't recycled in municipalities because of the different recycling rules. And so we opted for paper packaging because, you know, mm-hmm. that, that has the most, the highest likelihood that people can recycle it. And so doing that research into every single step is, is critical to really make sure that you're making sustainable choices. Um, mm-hmm. But it's hard work to do, right? And that's why, yes. that's why I think it's great that, that you're doing what you're doing, Dennis. Yeah. No, that's amazing. Like with everyone who I'm speaking and also from my personal experience, like one of the first steps is always just creating awareness. And then once we are being aware about some of the things, how they happen, what's in the background, it's so much easier to think of like, oh, okay, if I buy something, what kind of implication does it have if it's not local or if the packaging is not recycled, or if it's plastic? So really being, being able to just like, hey, the first step is I need to know what I need to be aware about and what I then can have a look into and change. Yeah. Amazing. Mm-hmm. Now, Let's let's go to the next like the f- final part basically. And when you want to share something with our viewers, basically to become more more impactful, what would be your number one tip for our viewers to become more impactful based on everything that you've learned so far? Yeah, that's a really yeah, that's a really challenging question. Um, I think it's going to be different for every consumer and every person depending on where your where your values lie. But when it comes to our industry specifically, when it comes to apparel, I think it's important to look at the companies that you're supporting. And if you can do that like extra little step of research, most companies will have something on their website. And if they're truly sustainable, they'll be quite transparent. So mm-hmm. I would say that it doesn't take quite as much work as you think it does. Like obviously there's a you can never do enough research, but if you're just if you're on you're busy on the go person, I would say definitely shopping local is amazing. And then if you can just like checking out the about us, the sustainable sustainability page of those websites and see what they are doing because, you know, it makes a difference every step of the way. And for these businesses that are doing their best to make sustainable choices, they are probably taking like smaller margins and they're probably working really, really hard to make that impact. And Again, like we were saying, it's every step of the way. So as a consumer, I think sometimes what you don't realize is the greater impact that you have on allowing that company to continue producing, to get bigger, to make more impact, to take on more sustainable raw material suppliers, to have more sustainable manufacturers around the world. Like it's such a domino effect. So I think it's almost like empowering the consumer. Remember Mm -hmm. how much like your dollar counts, your vote counts. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. Um, what Jess said at the end there is that I don't think sometimes consumers understand the impact that they have with the choices that they make. And not a lot of companies are, are sitting around deciding to become more sustainable because they want to. They're doing it because that's what consumers want, right? And the market follows where the money is. And if people are choosing to buy more sustainable items, then companies will make them, right? And so there is actually a lot of change that you can create even as an individual, as long as everybody's kind of moving together. And we saw that a lot, especially in Canada with, with food supply, right? Organic food. There was a a movement towards organic food and now every grocery store has an, an organic section. And I think it's just starting to take place now with, with other industries like the apparel industry where people are being more choiceful and you're seeing, you know, big brands, even like H and M take a stance and, you know, mm-hmm. recycling their previous materials and trying to use more sustainable materials because they don't want to lose people's money, right? Yeah, that's basically just being able to vote with the dollars. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. exactly. Yeah, awesome. No, thanks. Thanks so much, Ben. Thanks so much, Jess, for, for sharing your journey, for sharing everything that you're doing. Thanks so much for that as well. And all the best and continue all the best with, with Double as well. Thanks so much, Janice. It's been a pleasure. And to everyone else, thanks so much for joining and stay impactful. Mm